Today the Trekkers are taking you to Montpelier, James Madison's home near Orange, Virginia in the Piedmont region. We're going to show you all around this amazing place, but first we're going to stop by V.L. Murray Elementary School outside of Charlottesville to say hi to the 4th and 5th graders who had written us emails. I'm David. I'm Frank. And I'm Alfonso. And I'm Brad. And, and we're And we're here today in Charlottesville, Virginia in the Piedmont region. This is a very special podcast, not only because we get to spend time with the students at Murray Elementary, but it's our 50th anniversary, our 50th podcast. <laughs> and also, we have Brad with us today. Oh, and we're ready from here to James Madison's house called Montpelier. Boys and girls, if you're ready, let's go trekking! Let's, let's go trekking! Woo! Alright, so our first stop today is Montpelier, which you see behind us. And it's actually this whole property, and it was the property of James Madison. James Madison was born on this property, but he also died on this property. He was born here, but he actually moved into the house you see behind us when he was 13 years old. James Madison was the fourth president of the United States. He's called the father of the Constitution because he took detailed notes at the Constitutional Convention. And he married Dolly Madison, and they moved into the White House in Washington, D.C., and she was like the celebrity of Washington, D.C. She was like the Lady Gaga of that time. She threw huge parties at the White House. She was famous. And Dave likes her because she was the first person to serve ice cream in the White House. And Big Dave loves him some ice cream. That's right. How can I forget that? All right, so behind me, this is called the Temple. And this was right outside his house. This is where he came to just think and be quiet. And remember, he was called the father of the Constitution. And I bet a lot of his ideas, a lot of his good ideas for the Constitution came right while he was thinking in this little temple back behind me. I was just inside James Madison's house. We're not allowed to film inside there, but just imagine coming out of the house and looking over this bowl-shaped area of 5,000 acres. It was an incredible place to think, like Dave just told you, but man, the beauty and the nature. Take a look. Behind us, you see some frames that are being built, which represents where the slaves would have lived here at Montpelier. Um, at any given time, there could have been up to 100 slaves here. Um, that's uh, men, women, and children um, doing the various chores around the plantation to make it a success. And Paul Jennings was one of the slaves that lived here. And when uh, James Madison and Dolly Madison moved to uh, the White House when he was president, um, Paul Jennings came to the White House when he was 10 years old. And Paul and Dolly Madison were credited with saving one of the original portraits of George Washington during the Battle or during the War of 1812, when the British were about to burn down our White House. And Paul Jennings was with James Madison when he died here in the house, along with him. We're sitting here with Dolly and James, and it's nice to see you guys. And you notice that James is reading. He did a lot of that. And he used the second floor of his library to do a lot of research on different types of government. And he wrote the Virginia Plan, which was like the rough draft of the Constitution. And because he did his homework, they made him a leader at the Constitutional Convention. And a big thing with him was compromise. He believed that you didn't always have to get your own way, but you could work together to make things happen. So two good lessons from James Madison, compromise and do your homework. Now Dolly, let's start partying. Let's go. All right, so Brad and I are here in the uh, Madison Family Cemetery. And for a president and a founding father, we have to say this is not as fancy as we thought it was gonna be. It's rather understated. But the large monument you see behind me here was for James Madison, who died here on this property in 1836, and he was considered the last founding father. And if you can also look behind James Madison's uh, tombstone, or his memorial, his wife, Dolly Madison, was also buried here uh, 13 years later. Um, she received a state funeral as well. Many people turned out um, because she was a well-known hostess um, in the area, and many people came to pay their respects to her. Today, Montpelier looks like it did in James Madison's day, but it didn't always look like this. In 1901, the famous DuPont family moved into the house and made many changes, as you can see in this photograph. It's a lot larger. And if you look at it in Google Earth, using the timeline mode, you can see how it changed over time. Here's how the house looked in 1994, 
and then starting in 2003, they did the renovations, and now the way it looks today. And the DuPont family brought another change to the nearby town of Orange, and Brad's going to tell us about that. We're standing outside the historic Montpelier train station. This station was built in the year 1910 by a man named William DuPont. William DuPont purchased the Montpelier home, which was formerly James Madison's home, in 1901. He built this train station here because he wanted a place where a train could stop close to his house. So that's pretty, pretty creative, huh? This train station was um, existing all the way through the segregation time period. And as you can see, there was a waiting room for uh, the white folks as well as the colored folks. So remember, segregation was a time of, of separating people. Here we are on the side of Montpelier Station. And uh, just like any uh, place of operation for transportation, uh, like if you go to an airport or to a railroad uh, station, you have different forms of way to communicate. Here's one way in the past that they used to do it, and this is telegraph, where they used to push the buttons, and they used to have a certain code that they were sent. And of course, you guys should know about the telephone, or probably now the cell phone, but this is their way of communication right here. They would put set up, communicate with the operator. And then you all use computers now, and you know that you have to type, and you have your keyboard, but they have the same thing back, but they had something called a typewriter. And they would press the keys, and you can see where these things have ink, and the ink would get onto a piece of paper. So a little bit harder than on a computer. We've reached our last destination here at Montpelier Station in Orange, Virginia. We don't want you to get this Montpelier station mixed up with the actual town of Montpelier, which is outside of the city of Richmond. We've learned some interesting new facts about segregation and shown you some different waiting rooms at this train station. And our next stop is Ash Lawn, which is the home of James Monroe. So let's go trek in. Let's go! Let's go. Well, we actually didn't have time to go to Ash Lawn, so we'll have to do that in another podcast. But we did find this interesting house. So just a little bit down the road from Montpelier is a freedman's home. This was the house of a slave who used to work at Montpelier named George Gilmore. And him and his wife Polly and their children, after emancipation in 1865, they were freed and they had this house set up and this is where he lived. It was a difficult time for the freed slaves because even though they had been set free, they still had to find jobs and make money. And in the woods behind Gilmore's cottage, there used to be a Civil War camp. Confederate soldiers camped here during the winter of 1863 and 1864, and their camp may have looked something like this. Confederate troops camped right here in the woods. They had to build these makeshift houses that we're going to take you inside. We're inside of a Civil War winter camp. As you can see, boys and girls, up here, um, the, uh, the tent is put together with wood, and it's got a covering over top of it. Think about how cold it would be to sleep outside during the winter time. If you look at the ground, what do you see to help insulate the, the soldiers and the officers? Um, well, this is hay. I guess they use that as part of their bedding. Um, this, this kind of tent would be used with, by more than one officer. There may be two or three in here. Because as you'll see when we go outside, they're not that many. Um, the camp's not that big. So you're going to have to have more than one person. So you don't get your own room, boys and girls, even when you're an officer. All right, so now we, uh, we're out here at the Civil War camp. And you can see that it looks like they're getting ready to build another replica. So let's look at it. Huge trees cut down. Obviously we used a little bit more modern tools, but then they notch the wood so it fits in here. But if you look over here, look at this gap. If this is a winter camp, cold air, snow, rain, all the elements are gonna come right through here. So what they would do is they would notch the trees, it would leave a little bit of a gap, but then they would pack it with mud to fill in the gaps to try to keep some of the heat inside the cabin. We're so excited we've come to the end of our 50th podcast. We appreciate all your support. And don't worry, Trekkers, we still have lots more places to go visit. Lots more places to go, but right now, I think we're going to go celebrate in a very historic place called Mitchie Tavern. So be sure to check out VirginiaTrekkers.com for more podcasts. Let's head on out. Keep, Keep on, on trekking. trekking. This is my jam. Oh, I mean trekking. Alright, Brad. You gotta break it down. Oh, no, I was gonna do a hand. Turns out we just crashed.
I'm David. I'm Frank. Alright, I'm David. I'm Frank. And I'm Alfonso. And I'm Brad. And I'm Brad. Yeah. <laughs> we still have a lot more places to go trekking.